chapter six of abraham lincoln a history volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume nine by john hay and john george nicolay chapter six the last days of the rebel navy we have seen how through the incessant efforts of mr seward and mr adams the government of great britain had been brought to the point of prohibiting the building and the fitting out of confederate ships of war in british ports and also how napoleon the third had been convinced by gettysburg and vicksburg that a brusque treachery was more expedient than the fulfilment of his promises to mr slidell most of the rebel rams and ironclads built in confederate waters had come to miserable ends before reaching the open seas the power of the rebel navy was therefore strictly circumscribed in the latter years of the war and the few cruisers which were left afloat could do nothing more than destroy an occasional vessel in distant waters although using no weapon but the torch they were still able to inflict considerable damage upon unarmed and peaceful commerce but after a few months passed in alternate arson and evasion they all finished their careers in ways more or less ignoble in the spring and summer of eighteen sixty three the cruiser florida under the command of captain j n moffett burned a large number of small trading vessels on the american coast and one of her tenders entered in june the harbor of portland maine and destroyed a united states revenue cutter lying there she then crossed the atlantic and took refuge in the harbor of brest she remained there all the autumn repairing and refitting in a government dock a large portion of her crew left her at that port and the work of filling their places with british sailors was slow and tedious the autumn and part of the winter passed in this way and it was late in february before the florida now under command of lieutenant c m morris began another cruise in the west indies and on the american coast she made few depredations however during the summer and on the fourth of october anchored in the harbor of bahia in brazil the thorough refitting she had received in the french port the light work she had done during the summer had left her in nearly perfect condition officers and crew says bullock were in fine spirits and hoped to accomplish a good deal of work still but when at twilight on the fourth of october she entered the brazilian harbor the trap was sprung and the sea rover had finished her career at the dawn of the next day the united states steam corvette washeset commanded by napoleon collins was discovered at anchor not far off captain morris went on shore where he was received with special kindness by the president of the province the brazilian admiral on duty at bahia being also present at the interview the confederate cruiser was granted a stay of forty-eight hours for some trifling repairs he said were necessary and it was intimated to him that an extension if it was wanted would not be refused to put him still more at his ease the admiral suggested that he should anchor the florida between his flagship and the shore which morris at once did and feeling now perfectly secure he permitted one half of his crew to go on shore and the next day the liberty men having returned the other half with captain morris and some of his officers took their turn to visit the town he had received during the day in an irregular manner a challenge from the wachusett conveyed through the united states consulate with the understanding that in case it was accepted the consul would use his influence to facilitate whatever repairs were needed on the florida captain morris declined this eccentric defiance saying that he came to bahia on his own business and should leave when he liked that if he should happen to meet the wachusett outside of the port he would fight her but he had no thought of impending conflict in his mind when after amusing himself during the evening in town he went to bed 
his slumbers were broken before daylight by the landlord of the hotel where he lodged who told him that firing and cheering had been heard from the direction of the florida as soon as the florida had anchored in the port thomas f wilson consul of the united states at bahia sent a protest to the president of the province against the admission of that vessel to free practice and also claimed that she should be detained for having in combination with the pirate alabama violated the sovereignty of the imperial government of brazil by capturing and destroying vessels belonging to citizens of the united states of america within the territorial waters of brazil near the island of fernando de naranja in april eighteen sixty three this demand having been refused by the president on the same day the consul reported the action of the authorities to commander collins who at once resolved to take the matter into his own hands in his report to the secretary of the navy he says that he thought it probable the brazilian authorities would forbear to interfere as they had done at fernando de naranja when the rebel steamer alabama was permitted to take into the anchorage three american ships and to take coal from the louisa hatch within musket shot of the fort and afterward within easy range of their guns to set on fire those unarmed vessels it cannot be doubted that commander collins thought this was the course which the brazilian government in justice and impartiality should have pursued but it can hardly be believed that he had full confidence in their abstention it is clear that the consul felt that he would be safer beyond brazilian jurisdiction after the blow had been struck as he volunteered to remain on board the wachusett during the attack and afterwards accompany her to sea at three o'clock on the morning of the seventh of october the wachusett slipped her cable and steered for the florida a little more than half a mile away collins's intention was to sink the corsair on the spot but unforeseen circumstances prevented him from striking her as he intended he struck her instead on the starboard quarter cutting down her bulwarks and carrying away her mizzenmast and breaking her main-yard with no injury whatever to the wachusset she then backed off believing the florida would sink from the effects of the blow a few pistol shots fired by the confederates were answered by a volley of small arms from the wachusset and in the excitement of the moment two broadside guns were fired from the national vessel contrary to collins's orders when the confederate lieutenant j k porter finding further resistance impossible came on board the wachusett and surrendered a hawser was at once attached to the florida and the wachusett with her prize moved out to sea the brazilian naval commander had seen in the dim light of the morning the wachusett approaching the florida and had sent an officer to warn her off this intimation was received after the collision and the humorously evasive answer of the american was that he would do nothing further a short while afterwards the united states vessel was seen apparently returning to her berth but to the surprise of the brazilian the florida seemed to be following her and it was soon discovered that she was in tow the brazilian fired three guns at the wachusett none of which struck and as soon as steam could be made commander masebo started in pursuit but the stern chase was hopeless from the first and by noon the american vessels had disappeared below the northern horizon and the brazilian returned to draw up the report which should form the basis of the diplomatic demand which the imperial government had once made on that of the united states collins arrived with his prize at hampton roads on the twelfth of november where on the twenty eighth she foundered while lying at anchor so seasonable a disaster of course gave rise to rumours of collusion for which there seems to have been no just foundation a naval and a military court of inquiry were held from which it appeared that the sinking of the florida was accidental the government of brazil protested with great energy against the act of commander collins and promptly demanded reparation which was readily granted by the president jealousy of foreign intervention in every form said mr seward in his reply to the brazilian minister and absolute non-intervention in the domestic affairs of foreign nations are cardinal principles in the policy of the united states 
you have therefore justly expected that the president would disavow and regret the proceedings at bahia he will suspend captain collins and direct him to appear before a court-martial the consul at bahia admits that he advised and incited the captain and was active in the proceedings he will therefore be dismissed the flag of brazil will receive from the united states navy the honors customary in the intercourse of friendly maritime powers having thus done justice to the international law which had been violated by captain collins the secretary administered a severe rebuke to the government of brazil for its ascribing the character of a lawful naval belligerent to insurgent citizens of the united states he claimed that the florida like the alabama was a pirate belonging to no nation or lawful belligerent and therefore that the harboring of these piratical ships in brazilian ports was a wrong and injury for which brazil justly owed reparation to the united states as ample as the reparation which she now received from them these positions of this government said the secretary are no longer deemed open to argument it does not however belong to the captains of ships of war of the united states or to the commanders of their armies or to their consuls residing in foreign ports acting without the authority of congress and without even executive direction and choosing their own time manner and occasion to assert the rights and redress the wrongs of the country this power can be lawfully exercised only by the government of the united states he therefore equally condemned the conduct of the american and the brazilian officers in the port of bahia subordinate agents he said without the knowledge of their respective governments mutually inaugurated an unauthorized irregular and unlawful war in desisting from that war on her part and in appealing to this government for redress brazil rightly appreciated the character of the united states and set an example worthy of emulation the officers of the florida were released and soon afterwards sailed for england the act of collins was one of many instances where brave and patriotic naval officers have in defiance of international law committed acts of aggression on the territory of neutral powers seeing an important end to be accomplished he took the responsibility of violating neutral territory and of facing whatever punishment might result from his act his conduct was not unlike that of nelson when he attacked the danish fleet at copenhagen of captain hellyer when he cut out the essex under the guns of the chilean battery at valparaiso and of captain daniel turner when he chased the federal into the harbor of st bartholomew and captured her at the very mouth of the swedish cannon an attempt has been made by confederate writers to show that the exploit of collins in the harbor of bahia differed from those we have mentioned in the fact that the consul of the united states had promised the president of the province that no act of aggression should be committed by the rechesset but there is no claim that collins participated in this promise and he was under no honorable obligation to regard it he broke the law and took his punishment with equal bravery and fortitude when in the early part of the year eighteen sixty four the emperor of france suddenly changed his mind in regard to the building of confederate ironclads in france and ordered the astonished m armand to sell them to some other power the government of denmark which was then in trouble with prussia acquired one of the rams which captain bullock had originally ordered there was at the same time says captain bullock an express understanding between m armand and me that the sale of the corvettes should be purely fictitious and that the negotiations in respect to the rams should be kept in such a state that we might get possession of them again if there should be any change in the policy of the emperor's government before their completion the ship was sold to denmark and was sent to copenhagen under the french flag with a french crew captain bullock however still remained in communication with m armand watching for an opportunity to repossess himself of the sphinx as the ram had been named there had been great delay in the completion and delivery of the vessel denmark had been defeated by prussia in the schleichwig holstein controversy and the sphinx had not been made ready in time to take part in the war 
monsieur armand learning that the danish government was willing to part with its bargain prolonged the negotiations until captain bullock could collect a staff of officers a crew and sufficient stores and the year eighteen sixty five had begun before all was in readiness the sale was effected and the stone wall as the ram was rechristened sailed from copenhagen on the sixth of january a tender was purchased and fitted out and the two vessels met at the bay of quiberon belle isle on the twenty fourth where the ram took on her crew and her stores and sailed for ferrol all the labour and expense which had been bestowed upon her was to be without avail she lay in the harbour of ferrol until the twenty fourth of march and then evading the niagara and sacramento which indeed showed no eagerness to attack her she made her way to lisbon thence striking westward she arrived at havana early in may learning that lee had surrendered and jefferson davis was captured her commander gave up the stone wall to the captain-general of cuba receiving sixteen thousand dollars in money to pay off his crew the spanish government handed her over to the united states receiving the money the captain-general had disbursed and shortly afterwards the stonewall again changed her name and her flag and became the property of the emperor of japan commander m f maury better known as a man of science than as a naval warrior had been sent to england towards the close of the year eighteen sixty two for special service and very much was expected of him by the richmond government which probably exaggerated his influence with the ruling classes of that country his special duty was the investigation of the subject of submarine defences and the manufacture and use of explosives he had also authority to buy and equip a cruiser if he thought it practicable and under this authority he purchased an ironclad clyde-built screwed steamer called the japan and put his cousin w l maury on board as commander changing the name of the ship to the georgia his enlistment of her crew gave rise to a prosecution against two persons named jones and hyatt for a violation of the foreign enlistment act a jury at the liverpool assizes found them both guilty and they were each fined fifty pounds the georgia cruised for several months in eighteen sixty three destroying six or seven american vessels but being ill handled and ill managed she came back to europe for repairs and went into the government dock at cherbourg where she remained four months in march eighteen sixty four she went out again but soon afterwards put in at bordeaux whence in despair of accomplishing anything more with her she was dispatched to liverpool and sold to a merchant of that city her war fittings were removed and with a british register and flying the british flag under charter of the portuguese government she sailed in august from liverpool for lisbon but her peaceful appearance and her honest intentions could not save her she was captured by the niagara off the mouth of the tagus and condemned and sold in a united states prize court another of commodore maury's purchases came to no better fate he bought at sheerness in november eighteen sixty three a dispatch boat called the victor but before she had been made ready for a cruise maury took alarm and hurried her across the channel to calais a staff of confederate naval officers boarded her in the transit she went through the ceremony of being commissioned as a ship of war and entered the harbour of calais under the name and style of the confederate ship rappahannock mr dayton remonstrated strongly against her being received but the french government insisted that she could not be refused asylum as she had entered the port in distress although his protests were not sufficient to keep her out they were of sufficient force to keep her in and after her repairs were completed mr slidell exhausted all his powers of argument and persuasion in the fruitless attempt to induce the government of the emperor to allow her to depart she lay at calais enjoying the fatal hospitality of france until the war ended and the united states government took possession of her the dispatches of mr slidell to the government in richmond in regard to this matter form a most amazing chapter of the diplomatic history of the rebellion the emperor acted not only towards mr slidell but towards his own ministers with almost inconceivable duplicity 
we shall hereafter show how disastrous an effect the controversy over the rappahannock exercised on the fortunes of the alabama and after that famous cruiser had been sent to the bottom of the channel by the guns of the kearsarge the emperor still continued the most astounding mystifications and falsehoods to the american minister the confederate commissioner and his own government on the eleventh of july slidell wrote to mr benjamin i called on the first instant on messrs morney and persigny to invoke their good offices in the affair of the rappahannock i expressed very fully my opinion of the conduct of the foreign minister in which they heartily concurred and promised me the former to speak and the latter to write to the emperor on the subject on the seventh i received from mr persigny a note enclosing an autograph letter of the emperor of the same day in these words mon cher persigny j'ai donné l'ordre pour que le rappahannock puisse quitter les ports de france mais il ne faut pas que le ministre américain le sache croyez à ma sincère amitié napoléon in response to an inquiry made of my friend at the foreign affairs he wrote to me on the ninth instant aucune décision n'a été prise au sujet du rappahannock me dit de le mais la dit est répétée hier soir en attendant le rappahannock faire bien de prendre des précautions pour ne pas être pincé par un des croiseurs fédéraux qui le surveillant this caution says mr slidell was rather inconsistent with the declaration that no decision had been made but supposing it possible that the order might have been given to the minister of marine i called on him immediately to ascertain the fact and showed him the emperor's letter saying that as the minister of foreign affairs said that no decision had been made on the subject of the rappahannock i presumed that the order had been communicated directly to him he assured me that such was not the case and was evidently surprised at the discrepancy between the emperor's letter and the declaration of his foreign minister the emperor seems at this time to have carried on his government in water-tight compartments he gave separate directions in a different sense to each of his ministers m Doyen de lui was directed to give satisfactory assurances to mr dayton the minister of marine was authorized to be on the best possible terms with mr slidell persigny and mascar napoleon's nearest familiars were frank and avowed confederate sympathizers even the president of the senate presiding over the committee of juris consults received orders from the tuileries as to legal decisions which were to be rendered in the case of the rappahannock and the emperor held himself perfectly free to repudiate anything said by either of these officers or by himself when occasion required it when at last napoleon the third gave the peremptory order that the rappahannock should be allowed to leave the ports of france it was coupled with the condition that she should take away no larger crew than she had brought into calais this was a bitter disappointment to mr slidell and his associates the rebel envoy represented to the imperial government that if this point were insisted on the permission to go to sea was altogether illusory the minister of marine expressed his deep regret at the stringency of the instructions under which he was acting and which allowed him no discretion he volunteered to make an effort to induce his colleagues to relax the rigor of the conditions but a few days later informed mr slidell that after a full discussion in cabinet council under the presidency of the empress it was decided not to change the instructions commodore samuel barron and captain bullock then concluded that it was not worth while for the rappahannock to attempt to go to sea with this insufficient number of men the difficulty of getting a new crew from england the presence of four union cruisers in the neighborhood of calais the inability of the ship to carry more than five days full supply of coal were the discouraging circumstances which induced the confederate agents to leave the rappahannock to her fate in the port of calais mr slidell attributed his failure in this matter to the ill-will and bad faith of m de louis 
strange as it may seem he says the fact is patent that mr drayton has managed to convince him that the lincoln government is prepared to go to war with france if not directly at least by pursuing a course towards mexico which would necessarily soon result in open hostilities i still believe that the emperor is decidedly our friend but the mexican question and his well-founded distrust of england will continue to prevent any favourable action on his part in which she will not fully participate the course of the imperial government in this matter caused deep indignation in richmond when mr davis read slidell's dispatch of may two eighteen sixty four in which he said that he had instructed fauntleroy to strike his flag and abandon the rappahannock in the port of calais the confederate chief made this angry note in pencil for mr benjamin too much has been borne of evasion and indignity in relation to the rappahannock nothing was left but the course it was while the triangular controversy was going on between the american legation the imperial government and the confederate emissaries in regard to the hospitality extended to the rappahannock in the ports of france that captain semmes arrived with the alabama in the harbor of cherbourg with thirty-seven prisoners on board captured from american merchant vessels mr dayton lost not a moment in laying a brief and menacing protest before the minister of foreign affairs he had said some time before when protesting against the presence of the florida and the georgia that it needed only the alabama to make the french ports a rendezvous for the entire rebel navy and monsieur Drouillon de louis irritated by the epigram said hastily monsieur i will not permit that vessel to come in it is not to be doubted that m drouillon de lui would gladly have warned off this troublesome visitor but there was so much of sympathy with the confederate cause in the highest official circles that he was unable to effect this the terms however on which the alabama was admitted to the port were those of harsh and grudging welcome the minister of marine wrote to the admiral prefect at cherbourg that the alabama could not be permitted to enter into one of the basins of the arsenal but, but might address itself to commercial accommodations for such urgent repairs as it needed that it was not proper for one of the belligerents to be continually making use of the french ports as a base of operations the admiral prefect was further ordered to observe to the captain of the alabama that he had not been forced to enter into cherbourg by any accidents of the sea and that he might just as well have gone somewhere else the moment the alabama appeared mr dayton had telegraphed to captain john a winslow who was at flushing with the united states ship kearsarge who came with all haste to cherbourg he did not enter the port as that would have subjected him to detention but he steamed by the breakwater from end to end without anchoring an act accepted both by semmes and the french officers in the port as a virtual challenge it has suited captain semmes and other confederate writers to represent his acceptance of this chivalrous defiance as a bit of heroic self-sacrifice in encountering an overwhelming superiority of force this is clearly an afterthought the two ships were not unequally matched the alabama was somewhat larger than the kearsarge and carried one more gun the kearsarge was in better condition with a crew superior in numbers and under far better discipline and training it is only fair to captain semmes to say that he did not hesitate for a moment to accept the combat thus afforded him he says in his diary of the fifteenth of june the two ships were so equally matched i did not feel at liberty to decline it he sent notice to the united states consul through m bonfi the confederate agent that he would go out to engage the kearsarge as soon as he could get ready he at once ordered a load of coal on board which was in itself a notification to the authorities of immediate departure m bonfils did not share in the confidence of the confederate cruiser his fear of the result of the coming fight so grew upon him that he sent on the eighteenth of june a letter full of panic to mr slidell in paris imploring him to order captain semmes to desist from a contest which he felt would be fatal mr slidell answered on the morning of the nineteenth of june just as he was starting to the races at fontainebleau declining to give any such advice to captain semmes i have the most entire confidence he said in his judgment his skill and his cool courage i believe he would not proceed to the encounter of the kearsarge unless he thought he had a reasonable chance of capturing her 
in reply to m bonfils's assurance that the alabama would be welcome to the government docks at cherbourg mr slidell expressed his doubt as to whether any such permission would be granted i have recently he said had sad occasion in the case of the rappahannock detained without cause since the seventeenth february to know how long an unfriendly minister may delay the decision of the plainest case the french government had been greatly embarrassed by the arrival of the alabama at cherbourg and their embarrassment was not lessened by the promptness with which captain winslow came to the rendezvous m droyen de lui in conversation with mr dayton strongly objected to a sea-fight in the face of france and at a distance from the coast within reach of the guns used on shipboard in these days the reason of the old rules he said which assumed that three miles was the outermost reach of a cannon shot no longer existed and in a word a fight on or about such a distance from their coast would be offensive to the dignity of france and they would not permit it mr dayton of course declined to accept such an off-hand modification of a rule of international law but courteously said that he would prefer that the american ship should bring on a fight a little further off if no advantage were lost by it he wrote at the same time to captain winslow informing him of the feeling of the french government telling him he had a perfect right to fight three miles off the coast but that he had better choose his battleground six or seven miles away from france if he lost nothing by it captain winslow took upon himself to assure the admiral prefect that no question should arise about the line of jurisdiction accordingly when on the morning of the nineteenth the day being fine the atmosphere hazy and a gentle breeze blowing from the west the alabama was seen coming out of the western entrance at cherbourg accompanied by the french ironclad couronne which was charged with the keeping of peace within the marine league captain winslow determined that no controversy of jurisdiction should possibly arise and also that if he once laid his hands upon the alabama she should not get again within neutral waters steamed away to seaward clearing for action as he ran the alabama in pursuit until the kearsarge had attained a point seven miles from the french coast he then turned short about and steered directly for the alabama his purpose being to run her down or if that were not practicable to close in with her but as soon as the kearsarge came round the alabama sheered presenting her starboard battery and when the ships had come within about a mile of each other she opened her full broadside and began firing rapidly the shot did little damage to the kearsarge another and another broadside came thundering from the confederate corsair still without harm to the union vessel except to the rigging the kearsarge was now within nine hundred yards of her enemy and had not yet fired a shot but her commander apprehensive that another broadside which would have raked her might prove disastrous sheared his vessel and opened on the alabama the vessels now lay broadside and broadside and winslow feared that semmes might make for the shore to defeat this he made up his mind to keep full speed on to run under the stern of the alabama and rake her to avoid this semmes kept shearing and as a consequence the two vessels with a full head of steam fell into a circular track which continued during the whole engagement the duel thus begun neither side could withdraw from it winslow intent upon destroying his his enemy had no fear except that she should escape to french waters and he held her so close that the two vessels in this deadly waltz drifted slowly westward in a three-knot current and winslow was able to finish his work five miles from land the firing of the alabama was at first rapid and wild though it improved towards the close of the action on board the kearsarge the firing was much more deliberate the men had been ordered to point the heavy guns below the water line reserving the lighter ones to clear the deck at closer quarters the time for this latter service however never arrived the alabama was defeated before grape could be used the confederate fired some two shots to one fired by the kearsarge but with very little effect only three persons were wounded on the national vessel of whom one afterwards died while nearly every shot from the guns of the kearsarge told fearfully on the alabama six times the vessels had circled around each other the alabama with all her noise and fury during little damage while the steady fire of the kearsarge was working havoc on the decks and hull of the confederate 
at last on the seventh rotation semmes perceiving the battle was lost tried to take flight for the shore of france his port broadside was then presented to the kearsarge with only two guns bearing winslow now saw that his enemy was at his mercy and poured his shot into her and in a few moments had the satisfaction of seeing a white flag displayed over her stern the fire of his lighter guns which he had been keeping for close quarters was then reserved but a few moments later he was astonished by a renewed discharge from the two guns on the port side of the alabama winslow again opened fire and laid the kearsarge across the alabama's bows for raking when he discovered the white flag was still flying and again reserved his fire a moment later the alabama lowered her boats and an officer came alongside the kearsarge informing winslow that the ship was sinking twenty minutes later she went down by the stern her batteries rushing aft weighing her down her bows rising high out of the water the kearsarge had suffered so little during the engagement that captain winslow was taken somewhat by surprise at the sudden and complete defeat of his enemy the alabama had sunk before the kearsarge was ready with her boats to rescue the confederate crew while winslow was lowering his boats for this purpose he took notice of the english yacht deerhound which had steamed out from Cherbourg to watch the fight and requested john lancaster her owner to assist him in picking up the drowning men the latter instantly availed himself of this request in a manner which amazed the commander of the kearsarge in ten minutes after the request was made he had semmes and about forty of his officers and men on board and then instantly steamed away to the english shore some french pilot boats which had arrived upon the scene also took part in the work of rescue and carried their contingent to france so that winslow on the kearsarge had but a scanty show of prisoners a bitter controversy arose in regard to this action of mr lancaster and his conduct was the subject of severe animadversion in the report of the secretary of the navy mr wells said referring to semmes the same dishonor marked his conduct on this occasion as during his whole ignoble career before leaving cherbourg he deposited the chronometers and other trophies of his robberies on shore when beaten and compelled to surrender he threw overboard the sword that was no longer his own and abusing the generous confidence of his brave antagonist he stole away in the english tender whose owner proved himself by his conduct a fit companion for the dishonoured and beaten corsair it may be doubted however whether any man conscious of the acts which semmes had committed would have neglected any means of escape to neutral ground he could hardly have been expected to go voluntarily on board the kearsarge and deliver his sword to captain winslow and although the conduct of mr lancaster and his subsequent explanations of it showed clearly enough his warm and active sympathies with the confederate cause it must be admitted that captain winslow by requesting him to assist in saving the confederate crew from the waves was stopped from any further criticism of his conduct lancaster could not have been asked to assist captain winslow in the capture of prisoners of war if winslow had ordered him off under penalty of his being sent to follow the alabama to the bottom of the channel he would have been entirely within his right but having with instinctive humanity authorized him to pick up the men who were struggling in the water he had no reason to complain that the yasmin made off with them to southampton when mr lancaster arrived on english soil with captain semmes and his crew they were received with every demonstration of enthusiastic welcome and in the clubs and public journals friendly to the confederate cause an attempt was at once made to account for the result of the fight in a manner which should be equally honourable to confederate valour and british shipbuilding the simple truth that an american vessel built in great haste in an american shipyard manned by american sailors armed with american ordnance in a fair duel lasting an hour should have sent to the bottom a ship built with the utmost care in a british yard manned by british sailors and armed with the most approved british guns the two vessels being almost absolutely equal in tonnage armament and equipment was intolerable and incredible the kearsarge was therefore represented as greatly superior in size and equipment and finally the assertion of captain semmes that he owed his defeat to the union vessel being armor-plated was eagerly seized upon as a solution of the mystery a few days after the battle captain winslow nettled at the fables current in regard to the affair 
wrote a letter to the daily news as blunt and sailor-like as his manner of fighting setting forth the facts of the engagement and explaining the iron plating in these words in the wake of the engines on the outside the kearsarge had stopped up and down her sheet chains these were stopped by marline to eye bolts which extended some twenty feet and this was done by the hands of the kearsarge the whole was covered by light plank to prevent dirt collecting it was for the purpose of protecting the engines when there was no coal in the upper part of the bunkers as was the case when the action took place the alabama had her bunkers full and was equally protected the kearsarge went into action with a crew of one hundred and sixty-two officers and men the alabama by report of the deer hounds officers had one hundred and fifty semmes after the habit of beaten commanders claimed that this simple expedient of winslow's gave him the victory and further asserted that if a shell which he lodged in the stern post of the kearsarge had exploded the result would have been different it is idle to discuss these hypotheses the facts are that no missile struck the chains on the kearsarge which would have done any serious damage had the chains not been there and the shot in the stern post was fired after the alabama was hopelessly beaten in france the news caused a great sensation the emperor heard it on the grand stand at the fontainebleau races and prince murat at once bore the evil tidings to mr slidell the emperor said the prince was deeply grieved and when this friendly intermediary repeated to his majesty mr slidell's charge that the delay in granting the alabama access to the military port had caused captain semmes to go outside to meet his fate the emperor said mr slidell was mistaken as the permission had been granted mr slidell however cherished his grievance in spite of the emperor's assurances and returning to paris demanded an audience of the minister of foreign affairs m drouin de louis met him with that courtesy which every one about the emperor seems to have had orders to show to the confederate emissary saying that he and everybody connected with the government were profoundly afflicted at the loss of the alabama qu'il ne faisait pas du sentiment but sincerely felt all that he expressed mr slidell refused to be cajoled he said that candor compelled him to declare that the disaster of the alabama lay at the door of the minister of foreign affairs or the minister of marine that if permission to enter the military port had been accorded the point of honor which had induced captain semmes to encounter a superior foe would not have been raised the minister denied the fact alleged but the well-informed mr slidell quoted the instructions to the military prefect which as we have seen amounted to an intimation that captain semmes visit was unwelcome mr slidell continued that he was obliged to say he had observed some months past a growing disposition to treat his government with scant courtesy and that even the neutrality which the emperor had proclaimed was not observed towards them a line of observation which m drouin de louis at once checked with some appearance of temper says mr slidell before the interview ended mr slidell asked the minister categorically if the sentiments of the emperor had for any cause become less friendly towards the confederacy that he was quite at a loss to imagine any such cause but that in relation to the ships they had been induced to build by his suggestions and for which they had expended large sums of money raised with great inconvenience and sacrifice they had been treated with extreme harshness and it was difficult to account for such a sudden change of policy if there were no corresponding change of feeling the minister with a significant smile declined to enter into this subject but assured mr slidell that the feeling of the emperor was unchanged he was as he always had been prepared to recognize the confederacy but he would not act alone in reply to mr slidell's inquiry whether the failure of grant before richmond would improve the chance of recognition the minister naturally answered in the affirmative and dismissed the southern envoy with suave regrets at the catastrophe of the alabama and, and hopes of speedy good news from virginia at his next interview with the minister of marine he was made happy by the statement that the catastrophe of the alabama had produced the most beneficial effect upon public opinion that while they had lost some valuable lives in a ship that had proved capable of good service they were compensated a hundredfold by the prestige which everywhere but above all in france attaches to chivalrous daring and the jealous observation of the point of honor and that the material loss could not be weighed against the moral gain when one is consoling a troublesome suitor whose requests are denied beforehand words cost little
and if m de chasseloup lobas thought it worth while to say that the confederacy had gained anything by the loss of the alabama it cost no more to say it had gained a hundredfold the last place where the confederate flag floated on sea or on shore was at the masthead of the shenandoah after the war had ended everywhere else this inglorious vessel carried the torch of devastation among the poor and hardy sailors of new england in the arctic seas she was purchased by captain bullock in september eighteen sixty four sailed from liverpool to funchal where she met her tender and took on her armaments and stores on the twentieth of october a large number of the men sent out in the tender refused to volunteer for service in the corsair which caused the confederate lieutenant j f ramsay to report that he never saw such a set of curs in all his experience at sea under the command of captain j i waddell an old officer of the united states navy the shenandoah began her career in the southern seas in the late autumn and had destroyed eight vessels in the equatorial belt of the atlantic by the time she arrived at melbourne on the twenty fifth of january eighteen sixty five she was hospitably received at that port and remained there until late in february when she set sail for the north her officers recount her exploits in bering sea with a pride which under the circumstances is unaccountable they destroyed a great number of little whalers they pilfered watches and chronometers and such small sums of money as they could find among the thrifty sailors lighting the icy seas with pitiful bonfires and all this theft and wanton waste was perpetrated after captain waddell knew of lee's surrender to grant he himself admitted in a published letter of the twenty seventh of december eighteen sixty five that he captured after reaching bering sea the ship william thompson and brig susan abigail both had left san francisco in april these captures were made about the twenty third of june and from each he says i received san francisco papers these papers profess to have the correspondence between generals grant and lee concerning the surrender of lee's army he pretends however that he believed the war would be kept up by president davis and he therefore to use his own language continued my work until it was completed in the arctic ocean on the twenty eighth of june eighteen sixty five when i had succeeded in destroying or dispersing the new england whaling fleet he fell in with no other vessel after leaving bering sea until the second of august when he spoke to a british bark fourteen days out from san francisco and received information of the capture of jefferson davis waddell beginning to realize his true position set sail instinctively for the port from which he had departed he tried to give his sea rover the innocent appearance of a merchant vessel he closed her ports whitewashed her funnel and strove to obliterate every external appearance of a warlike character like any other criminal running for his lair he avoided speaking to any vessel that he met and slunk by night on the sixth of november into the mercy the shenandoah was at once placed under detention by the officers of the customs and soon afterwards handed over to the united states captain freeman who had been put in command of her started for new york a furious storm arose and after fighting against head winds and wintry seas for several days she returned in a crippled condition to liverpool she was then put up for sale to the highest bidder and bought for the sultan of zanzibar his majesty intending her for the dignified position of a royal yacht she was fitted out and furnished in a luxurious manner but the sultan soon tired of his new favorite after the fashion of sultans and the yacht became once more a merchant vessel after four years of peaceful commerce she met with an honorable death on a coral reef in the indian ocean End of chapter 6